Thanks, Larry. So it's a pleasure to be here uh, on this occasion, uh, the opening of the exhibit that uh, salutes uh, the uh, work that's been done, uh, the field of genomics, uh, and the promise of genomics. Uh, and I think uh, my job is to give you the perspective of somebody uh, whom over the last 30 years has gone from uh, being one of the foot soldiers in the trenches uh, to try to figure out how to actually do all this DNA sequencing stuff, uh, to about 10 years ago uh, becoming the director of one of the three large-scale genome centers that are funded by the uh, NHGRI. So I was about in the mid to late 1980s, I was a postdoctoral fellow at Caltech uh, working with a guy named Leroy Hood. Uh, and the group that I was working in was trying to develop automated DNA sequencing. We'd been doing DNA sequencing for several years. Uh, we used lots of radioactivity and things like that to actually uh, get results. Uh, it was slow, manual, hard to do, uh, and we didn't really get uh, all that much data out of every ex experiment that we did. So we set about developing a technology that was much safer, much more automated, much more efficient, uh, and hopefully cost uh, quite a bit less than what it cost to do sequencing the way we did it in the mid-80s. And uh, while I was working in the lab, uh, my boss would occasionally come back from these meetings uh, where they discussed the possibility of sequencing the Human Genome Project. And what did we think about that? And we said, eh, that's a great idea. We think you should continue going to these meetings. Uh, but we'd get together at our uh, postdoc lunches and say, this is crazy, but what the heck? Sounds like a good idea. And yeah, you know, we can kind of see what the benefits for this would be. Uh, so I think we should go for it. Uh, in 1990, I moved to Washington University in St. Louis um, with one of the first genome sequencing grants that came from what was then known as the National Center for Human Genome Research. Uh, and our grant basically had two goals. The first was to begin to sequence the genome of a model organism called C. elegans, which is a little roundworm uh, that is interesting mainly because it's taught us a lot of important biology, uh, including apoptosis, uh, which is programmed cell death, which has become very important in a number of human diseases, including cancer, uh, as well as to start to build the infrastructure, the methods, some of the software, et cetera, that would be uh, instrumental, or uh, indeed critical, for actually thinking about sequencing even the first human chromosome, let alone the human genome. Uh, so uh, this went well. Uh, back in those days, we did draw parallels to the, to the space program, as Eric touched on. Uh, and, you know, uh, we made a goal uh, as a nation uh, uh, to land a man on the moon and bring him safely back uh, to the planet Earth only after we'd you know, realized very modest success in, in launching a, a few rockets, uh, a few of which didn't explode, uh, and the, the most recent at the time of which actually carried a human into suborbital uh, flight. And that's kind of the same situation that we sort of uh, saw in front of us. So we had to sequence three billion base pairs uh, of, uh, of, of genome. Uh, and we really needed to do about six times that. That's what we needed, uh, we believe, to be very accurate. So about 18 billion bases uh, of the genome. Uh, and at the time, in 1990, one person could go off, spend a day in the lab, and generate about 12,000 base pairs of DNA sequence information. So we figured we needed about a million and a half person days, about 4,000 years, uh, uh, to actually get the job done. And it was expensive sequencing. This is why we just didn't get a thousand people and expect them each to spend four years getting the job done. Uh, you know, the goal for the, the genome project in the early 90s was to be able to sequence a genome for less than a dollar a base. And I can remember going to the Cold Spring Harbor meeting, uh, I think in about May of 1992, and reporting on the beginnings of the C. elegans genome sequencing project. Uh, and we'd done about a half a million bases, which was an amazing accomplishment in those days. But uh, Richard Gibbs, who's now the director of one of the other uh, centers, raised his hand at the beginning of the Q&A and said, how much was the cost per base, Rick? And I said, well, it was $17 a base. Now, there was a lot more than sequencing that had been done with those funds, a lot of development and so forth. Uh, but that's about the level that we were at, and we still had a long way to go. And if you think about computing, 
which was another challenge that we had back then. I actually had a portable computer in 1990. It didn't have a battery. You couldn't call it a laptop. If you actually tried to use it on your laptop, uh, you might injure your leg. Uh, you could take it home and plug it in. Uh, but if you think about what we have, you know, 10 years later, in about the time the Genome Project was finished uh, the first time, uh, the advances in uh, computing technology are incredible. But we did it. By 2000, we had a draft of the human genome sequence. By 2003, we had a largely finished uh, encyclopedia of the human genome that we could use. Sequencing technology evolved rapidly. Uh, but large-scale centers were really critical uh, in this project. Uh, there were uh, several large centers in the U.S. at the time, funded by either uh, what had then become NH NHGRI uh, or by the Department of Defense. Uh, but there were also centers uh, in many other countries around the world, including the Sanger uh, Center in the U.K. Uh, at the peak of our sequencing uh, work, uh, in about the time the Genome Project was finished, we had 135 of these expensive, complicated uh, DNA sequencers. Uh, as Eric touched upon, uh, one of the key things that we had going for us were companies like Applied Biosystems, uh, who was really the, the major uh, manufacturer of the key technology throughout the 90s. Uh, the companies could take technology that was developed sometimes in academia, sometimes at companies, uh, and commercialize and, most importantly, harden these technologies into boxes that we could use in the labs uh, to get the job done. They were supported uh, and they were repaired by the companies, but the centers really had a key role in sort of focusing on the methods, the applications, the software development, all the things that really made those uh, sequencing instruments uh, a powerhouse. So by 2003, uh, we could sequence a human genome uh, as, as Eric sort of said, for uh, something in the 15 to 20 million dollar range. Uh, I would argue that it probably took uh, a, a couple of years, uh, at least, rather than uh, a few months. But as sequencing technology has continued to develop uh, in the years since the Human Genome Project was finished, uh, I mean, it's been amazing. The biggest breakthroughs came in the mid-2000s as we started to get our hands on what is, what is known as next generation. Se sequencing technology. And today, in 2013, we can actually sequence an individual human genome and analyze that sequence for a cost of around $10,000, and we can do that in two to three months. Sorry, two to three weeks. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. Well, since 2003, uh, we've really focused on several crucial next steps uh, that have really built upon the Human Genome Project. We continued to refine the reference human genome sequence. It's the gold standard uh, by which genomic sequencing and medicine is currently performed. It's what we use to understand uh, the biology of genomes uh, and of human cells and animal cells as well. Uh, it was about 98 percent complete uh, in 2003 when we declared victory. Some of the regions that remained unfinished were essentially impossible to resolve with the technology and the methods that we had then. Uh, and we knew that some of these regions contained uh, important uh, human disease genes. Uh, several of them contain the kind of uh, variation that Eric uh, touched upon in his talk, which we refer to as structural variation. And those regions are characterized by very repetitive elements and are just almost impossible to sort out uh, with the technologies that we were using uh, even six or seven years ago. Well, we've resolved many of these uh, through the aegis of the Genome Reference Consortium. Uh, my lab in St. Louis is part of this, as is the Sanger Institute, uh, the National Center for Biotechnology uh, Information, and the European Bioinformatics uh, Institute. And by bringing in some of the new technology that's come available uh, over the last couple of years, uh, we've laid in plans to sort of take this gold standard to a platinum standard. The other key thing about the, uh, the reference human genome sequence is that it largely comes from a single individual. And as you just heard Eric uh, very nicely uh, uh, illustrate, uh, there's a tremendous amount of variation within the human population around the globe. And it's really critical that we start to capture more and more of that. Hum uh, Thousand Genomes Project was a great start, that we need to get deeper into to key uh, ethnic groups and really build sort of that uh, utility into the reference. This is going to be absolutely critical as we move ahead and start to uh, 
bring genomics into the clinic. With projects like ENCODE, uh, we've come a long way uh, in understanding all of that non-coding uh, DNA. Uh, there are uh, regions uh, where, as Eric mentioned, uh, they code for little bits of RNA that have their own uh, sort of atypical function. There are places where important proteins bind with the genome to turn genes on and off. Uh, and I would argue that, uh, you know, an understanding in diseases like cancer of what secondary functions uh, turn genes on and off uh, at the right time or in the right or even more concerningly uh, in the wrong cell type uh, is perhaps more critical than the mutations that we find uh, in the genes themselves. And with projects like HapMap and Thousand Genomes, we've really made a, a huge leap forward in starting to understand the diversity uh, of the human population. It's going to be absolutely critical uh, to better understand this so we can start to understand why some population groups are more susceptible to certain types of diseases. And by sequencing animal and pathogen and plant genomes uh, and understanding their biology, and comparing their genome sequences and their biology to our own genome sequence and our own biology, uh, we've come to better understand uh, not only ourselves but the other living things on the planet that might help or harm us. Uh, again, uh, NHGRI and the large-scale centers have really been key in driving this work forward. When the Human Genome Project was proposed back in the mid to late, mid to late 1980s, uh, one reason to do this was is that we would better understand disease. We would accelerate our ability to diagnose disease effectively, uh, develop new treatments, and eventually cure uh, many human diseases. I'm proud to play, have played a role uh, in two of the signature projects uh, that are both represented uh, in the exhibit uh, down on the second floor. Uh, and these uh, had made very, very uh, fundamental use of the human genome reference sequence uh, and the methods and technologies that we developed uh, to get to that point and in the years since. So the two I'll just give you quick examples of are TCGA and HMP, known by acronyms, uh, ac known by acronyms as many things at NIH are. Uh, you heard about TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas, which was a project, a joint project between NHGRI and the National Cancer Institute. And basically what's going on in that project is that the large-scale centers, uh, sequencing centers, have collaborated with a number of cancer biology labs uh, to start to build a very comprehensive genetic uh, catalog of uh, several different types of cancer. It's been amazing to see the results that have come out of that, and I'll touch on a few of those in a minute. But basically for several different types of cancer, like breast cancer, like lung cancer, we've been able to ge genetically dissect uh, several different forms of those cancers. So for example, uh, in both lung cancer and breast cancer, there are several subtypes of disease uh, which really weren't even known uh, very well uh, five, ten years ago. So now we can understand that some of these patients come to the clinic with a completely different disease. And in the case of lung cancer patients, quite often, lung cancer patients who have no smoking history are often expected to have a mutation in a gene called EGFR, epidermal growth factor receptor. And we can now test for that. And if they have a mutation in their EGFR gene, instead of giving them the very uh, nasty types of radiation uh, and chemotherapy, we, think we can give them a, a new class of drugs uh, called tyrosine kinase inhibitor with very few side effects and in some patients a very uh, dramatic response. Uh, in some patients, the tumors just essentially melt away. But not all patients respond uh, the same way. And so, again, we need to, to dig a little deeper and better understand what populations are going to be more susceptible to this particular subtype of cancer, which types of uh, patients are going to be more apt to respond to these new classes of drugs. The other project that I want to mention was called HMP, the Human Microbiome Project. And here we've been able to use all of this large-scale sequencing technology to start to catalog the population uh, of microbes that are present uh, in our uh, GI tract, uh, in the insides of our mouth and nasal passages uh, that are carried around with us all the time. Uh, and uh, there's a pretty good hypothesis 
that as uh, our health status changes, if we become ill, or maybe as a cause of becoming ill, uh, there's a change in these microbial uh, populations. Uh, and so this is sort of one of the new uh, areas over the last few years of genomics. And again, uh, the technology, the methods, the software, the infrastructure that were developed during the Genome Project have made these kinds of things possible. Well, to talk a little bit more about cancer, uh, in 2008, using this next generation sequencing technology that I mentioned a little earlier, my lab uh, at Washington University was able to publish the first report uh, of the genome sequencing of a cancer patient. Uh, and this was, uh, the patient was a woman uh, who lived in St. Louis and had been diagnosed with acute uh, myeloid leukemia. We actually sequenced two genomes from that patient. Uh, her normal genome, which came from some skin cells, uh, uh, which were taken at the time uh, that she had her first uh, bone marrow biopsy, and her tumor DNA, which actually came from the bone marrow biopsy itself. So uh, it blew our mind uh, that we could actually make this work. We used this new technology. It actually took us a couple years, not so much to do all the sequencing for that uh, patient, but to develop the software tools and to try to understand how to deal with the enormous amount of data that we had generated from this new technology. But it worked. Uh, in her tumor genome, we found 10 mutations in genes, uh, and we now know several years later, after sequencing uh, a couple hundred more patients with acute myeloid leukemia, we know the two genes uh, that we saw mutations in that ultimately caused her disease. So just in our lab alone, since that first cancer patient's genome, we've sequenced the genomes of over 1,500 cancer patients. This, again, is something that uh, I would have a hard, had a hard time believing uh, around 2000, 2003. But we've done it, uh, again, because of all these new developments. This number includes almost 1,000 genomes from pediatric cancer patients. And combined with the work that we've done as part of TCGA, uh, all of this work has really led to some uh, amazing new insights uh, into the biology of cancer. So I could give you examples. One of the things that we learned in our pediatric cancer genome project is we learned how to look at the genome and begin to differentiate in children that have acute uh, lymphocytic leukemia, the ones that have a fairly standard subtype of that disease and probably will do very well on standard chemotherapy, from a smaller group of kids who have a, a very severe and aggressive form of the disease called ETP-ALL, uh, who typically don't fare well unless their treatment is accelerated and uh, very aggressive. So now we can start to think about how we pinpoint those kids very early on in the diagnostic process. In uh, an adult form of a brain cancer called glioblastoma, one of the things that we learned uh, was that in some cases uh, of this brain cancer, uh, there are major mutations made to the mechanism that we all have uh, in our cells to repair DNA damage. Uh, and if you didn't know about that in a particular patient ahead of time, you might give them one of the most common chemotherapeutic drugs. Uh, but what we learned is that in these patients, that particular drug does more harm than good. In fact, it just continues to ravage uh, their genomes uh, and cause even more mutation. So now we can think about how we check for that uh, before we start treatment uh, in those glioblastoma patients. And finally, uh, in the disease I first mentioned, adult acute myeloid leukemia, or AML, we now have what we call uh, a genetic playbook that sort of gives us some direction as to which patients probably will, will fare best with uh, specific treatments. Uh, and as we go forward and we get a better association with the things that we found in the genome, uh, with what actually happens as those patients are uh, uh, treated, uh, we're going to be able to pull this together uh, and really use it in clinical practice. As you heard Eric mention, uh, a number of places uh, around the U.S. have now started to have some, some very uh, interesting uh, and early experiences with actually trying to do genome sequencing of patients who are currently in the clinic uh, and may have uh, a particularly uh, bad form uh, of cancer or uh, children that have a rare genetic disease. Uh, and we've had several cases of these. It's still very hard to do, 
Uh, as I said, um, the workup, the turnaround time is about a month for a cancer patient, and you'd like to turn the answer back to the oncologist much more quickly than that. But that's the, the best we can do now, although we see a, a great promise, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But for several of these cancer patients whose genomes we've sequenced and be able to give that information back uh, to uh, the treating physicians, this has already saved lives, uh, and perhaps uh, the most dramatic uh, example of this, uh, at least in our own experience, uh, was written up in the New York Times by Gina Collada uh, last spring, a case of a physician who was actually part of our group who was diagnosed with a second relapse of acute lymphocytic leukemia, wasn't given a very good prognosis, but in sequencing his genome, we found a mutation that could be uh, targeted with a drug that was approved for kidney cancer. Uh, and that was effective. Within 12 days, he was in uh, a complete remission, uh, and he uh, just accepted a uh, position to join the full-time faculty uh, on the 1st of July of this year. So this has been exciting, and as Eric touched upon as well, cancer is really uh, one of the first places that we've seen a big impact uh, of the new genomics technology. One of the things about cancer that sort of puts it right in the wheelhouse of modern genomics is, is that every patient essentially has a built-in control experiment, their normal genome. So we can sequence their normal genome, we can sequence their tumor genome, and we can compare and look in the tumor genome for the mutations that have arisen and probably uh, get clues to what actually not only caused their disease, but how we might be able to effectively uh, kill it. Uh, and we're now uh, in the large-scale centers starting to target uh, these more complex diseases, uh, as Eric mentioned, uh, that include Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the large-scale approach is really critical for these because there is no built-in control for every patient. So what we need to do is to sequence lots of people, cases in controls. Cases are folks that have a particular disease. The controls are the folks that don't have the disease. But because each person is already three million base pairs different, within their genome, it's difficult to say, is that particular variant related to their disease or simply uh, due to the fact that they're not the same individual whose genome we sequenced earlier? So there's a real need for scale here. We have to look at thousands of people uh, with and without disease. So we've come a long way uh, since those often contentious discussions about whether we should or shouldn't sequence the human genome. Uh, or whether we would learn much from doing it. We've learned a tremendous amount. Uh, we did it. We did it well. Uh, and uh, through the Human Genome Project, uh, and in the 10 years since, uh, we've developed incredibly powerful methods, technologies, software tools, uh, as well as infrastructure and the ability to manage huge amounts of data. Uh, we've learned an amazing amount of relevant human biology. Uh, We've uh, also learned an amazing amount of, and useful uh, amount of information about animal uh, and pathogen biology. We've learned valuable and applicable uh, things about human disease, and we can start to see how we move those into the clinic. So for somebody like me, who's been a part of all of this uh, since the beginning, I can't even remember, 20, 25, 30 years ago. Uh, it's exciting and it's satisfying, but I have to say that I'm really the most excited about the next 10 years. You know, I told you earlier that uh, we can now sequence and analyze an individual human genome for about $10,000 in a couple of weeks. But since I sort of sit in this position where I'm uh, able to have a pretty clear understanding of the trajectory uh, for the advancement of sequencing technology, I'm uh, ultimately looking forward to having one of these before 2023. So you guys are sitting there saying, what the hell is he talking about? He already has one of those. It's an iPhone. Well, you're only partially right. This is a prototype iSeq. And uh, the really cool thing about the iSeq is what you can do is there's a little small attachment that, it, that hooks on here at the data port. I can pipette in a drop of blood. I wait a little while. Data is generated. It hits the cloud uses the knowledge base that we've developed over the next 10 years. That's why it doesn't work now. And in a few minutes to a couple of hours, I get an answer, right? So when the technology gets there, and it's fast, and it's inexpensive, and it's able to take a benefit 
of all of the work from projects like TCGA, HMP, Thousand Genomes, et cetera, every cancer patient, every child that comes into the hospital with a rare genetic disease will have their genome sequenced effectively, accurately, uh, and at a low cost. So of course, to become reality, uh, this will require more hard work, additional large-scale projects to build the underlying knowledge base, and the question earlier about how we do this in a time of ever decreasing budgets is an excellent one. Uh, but we have to be optimistic, and we have to continue to work hard. And I think just having seen what's happened over the last 25 years with this technology, I told you about my portable computer in 1990. Uh, I have no doubt that, that that vision can become reality. So I'll stop there and uh, I'd be happy to answer questions. So uh, I was going to hold all questions for maybe the next three of you together. So let me. So don't go too far, though. So what I'd like to do is ask uh, Greg Lassier, the chairman and CEO of Life Technologies to come up and give us a little sense of the state of the, uh, of the industry and, and tell Rick how long it'll be till you guys make uh, the iSeq phone an attachment that he would like.